troublemaker, rebel, poisoner. In his time, Kenneth Griffith was called all these things. He was one of the most perversely brilliant Welshmen of the 20th century. Kenneth Griffith was a man of rare and peculiar talents. He was born and raised here in Tenby, but like so much else in his life, his feelings about his hometown were far from straightforward. Tenby, in Pembrokeshire, in southwest Wales, is the most beautiful seaside place I have ever seen. And that estimation of Tenby has nothing to do with the fact that I was born here and went to school here. Indeed, I am only just learning to like the place. Kenneth was born here in 1921. His parents, Peggy and Harold Griffiths, had married young. They split up and left Tenby when Kenneth was still a baby, leaving him in the care of Harold's parents. My parents leaving when I was six months old. I don't remember my mother and father when I was a small child. Uh, was a, an enormous piece of good fortune for me because my grandparents <laughs> were such splendid, beautiful people. Whatever I may be, for better or for worse, it's my grandfather in me. Ernest Griffiths was a stonemason and successful businessman. Kenneth grew up in an atmosphere of genteel prosperity, cared for by his nanny, Lily Phillips. But even as a child, he had a rebellious streak. It showed itself the day Lloyd George visited Tenby. Lily Phillips, who was given the job of looking after me, held me close to these very railings so that my infant years could receive the great liberal message. And in that moment that preceded the Welsh wizard's oration, I remembering the radical utterances of my uncle Reg, who was then known as a Bolshe, I screamed, give labor a chance, and was hustled away by Lily Phillips. No, I did not hear Lloyd George. Kenneth was a nonconformist in every sense of the word. His grandparents were strict Wesleyan Methodists who attended chapel three times a Sunday. For young Kenneth, it offered a taste of things to come. Wedged between my dear grandparents, I suffered acute claustrophobia, and I listened to terrifying sermons delivered by the great Welsh evangelists of that period. And for the first time, I observed the art of wholehearted and merciless histrionics. The Great Depression of the 1930s had a profound impact on Kenneth's life. It hit the building trade hard, and his grandfather's business suffered. The Griffiths family had to give up their nanny and their house in Tenby, and moved to the nearby village of Penali. But there was one ray of hope, in the shape of Kenneth's 11-plus exam results. My classmaster, Mr. Ensor Morgan, who actually spoke the words in front of me and many others, uh, when he saw that I was going to the Tenby Greenhill Grammar School, he shouted, it's a clerical error, impossible. Nobody disagreed. How could I possibly pass an examination? Kenneth was admitted to Green Hill Grammar School, where he met the woman he was to call his personal godsend. She was the first to recognize his rare talent for drama. Oh, I think he wasn't very interested in being educated, you know. He loved English, he liked writing, um, he loved acting. It's a gift to a teacher to have the natural reader and the natural actor to whom you can give the part, you know. I had some very moving performances out of lots of boys and girls, but n not such a natural as Kenneth. 
and I didn't shape him, you see. He shaped it himself. But Miss Ward did help shape Kenneth's future when she gave him the lead part in the school play Richard of Bordeaux. Well, he quite staggered, stayed old Tenby. All the townspeople, not just parents, would come flocking to see a play. And what a relief it was to escape from my poor self to become Hamlet or Iago or what have you. And the idea, I'd never seen an actor. I'd been to the cinema, but I'd never seen, never been inside a theater or seen an actor. But the idea, this was the door through which perhaps could I escape. Kenneth said that until then he'd been a vague lost soul. Now he had a sense of ambition and direction. Greenhill School could hold him no longer. The headmaster of this school at that time was J.T. Griffith, and he sent for me. J.T. said, I understand you want to be an actor. Well, will you do one favor for me before you leave? That name of yours, Griffiths, with an S. The S is an unhappy anglicization. Be a good chap and knock it off. And I did, at that very moment. In 1937, Kenneth left Tenby and set out for England, determined to be an actor. A bold move for a lad of 15. He moved to Cambridge, home of the Festival Theatre. And that was the first theatre building I'd ever seen. And I went to the stage door at the age of 15 and a half with my school notices from Richard of Bordeaux asked for the producer, a man named Peter Hoare, and he gave me an audition. He asked me, I did Richard of Bordeaux, I did some of Henry V, and he asked me if I'd come back the next day and do it again. What he hadn't told me, he had the entire company assembled in the gallery, and he gave me a job, paid me three pounds a week. So the first, which was plenty to live on then. Yes, so the was, first was, time I ever went into a theater building, I was a professional actor. Kenneth spent the next couple of years as a jobbing actor, playing in provincial repertory companies and tramping the streets of London in search of work. But by 1939, Britain was at war. Kenneth volunteered for the Royal Air Force. Just before he left to join the RAF, Kenneth returned home to visit his grandparents. They wanted to give him a present to remember them by and asked if he had any suggestions. After a careful consideration, he said he'd like a copy of Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf. He must have been the only British serviceman to carry a leather-bound copy of the Führer's autobiography with him at all times. He read it, he said, to understand the reasons behind the war. But during his RAF training in Canada, Kenneth contracted scarlet fever. His weight dropped to seven stone, and he was confined to a military hospital. There, to help pass the time, he began collecting stamps. This new hobby was to trigger in him a lifelong obsession. One day, I saw an envelope with a Natal stamp with Queen Victoria's head on. And the stamp was cancelled to my astounded eyes, Ladysmith Siege Post Office. The Siege of Ladysmith was a celebrated battle during the Boer War in which British soldiers held the town against superior Afrikaner forces. But then I wanted to know who had uh, posted the letter, what he was doing there, and one thing certainly led to another. <laughs> As a British serviceman, Kenneth empathized with the ordinary soldiers caught up in that conflict. In the years that followed, he read everything he could find on the Boer War and the history of the British Empire. Soon after he was given a medical discharge from the RAF, Kenneth married his first wife, Joan Stock. He also returned to acting. He tasted his first real success in the film The Shop at Sly Corner, in which he played a sadistic blackmailer. You'll be sorry for this, Archie. My place was in the shop, 
licking the boots of your classy customers. But you weren't so high class as a murderer, Mr. Heiss. They got you for that once, didn't they? And they'll get you again unless you're very, very careful. What do you want from me? I haven't quite made up my mind. I played the most monstrous villains uh, in films. The first one being the shop at Sly Corner. I mean, literally, uh, I've got into a railway compartment, and I don't exaggerate. And it was such a famous image at the time of evil personified that people have got out of the compartment. In 1952, Kenneth was invited to appear in a production of Midsummer Night's Dream, which was to tour South Africa. Kenneth set sail with the old Vic Company for Cape Town. It was a trip that was to prove a turning point in his life for reasons that had little to do with theatre. During the trip, he started a relationship with actress Doria Noah. But more significantly, he visited the scene of the Ladysmith siege. There, the sight of the graves of British soldiers had a profound effect upon him. He wrote, Poor lonely sods, the reality of empire. On his return to Britain, Kenneth left Joan and moved in with Doria. Around this time, he also met the actor who was to become his closest friend. Now, I was in the middle of rehearsal. I was the leading actor. Suddenly, the two swing doors opened, and there was a young tramp, six feet two, and he announced, he said, I'm sorry I'm late, darlings. Came down the steps, looked at me, picked me up, kissed me. I can't tell you, I can't tell you exactly what he said because you wouldn't allow it. But he said, I think you are something marvelous. Put me down and retreated to a corner and it was Peter O'Toole. <laughs> the two men became firm friends. But while O'Toole was beginning to make significant progress as a young actor, Kenneth found himself being typecast in one villainous role after another. I got trapped in those villains and they declined in quality of writing. Uh, and uh, it was uh, Roy Bolting who rescued me. Roy and John Bolting were responsible for some of the most successful British comedies of the 1950s and 60s. When Kenneth was cast in their film, Private's Progress, it gave him a chance to reveal his gift for comedy. I was seen Kenneth as a, as a serious, rather twisted and bitter things he played, but to suddenly see him uh, playing the most difficult things that we actors have to do, which is comedy, and bringing it off superbly with such elan, that, that, that delighted me. What happened to her? Oh, she married that furniture tycoon, Holliman. He went to Canada about ten years back to buy some timber, insisted on seeing the trees cut and fell. Very mean man. Still arguing about the price when one tree was falling. Killed him? Oh, yes. It was a major tree. With a quicker sidestep, he'd have had a bargain. So she's a widow? No doubt about it. He was buried in a coffin made from the tree that hit him. The lumbermen thought that was only just. Oh, fair enough. Very open-hearted lot, the Canadians. In 1962, Kenneth gave one of the comic performances of his career. Playing opposite Peter Sellers, he was cast as a hand-pecked Swansea librarian in Only Two Can Play. Yes, yes, of course, Mrs. Griffith Williams, and, and thank you. And thank you, John. Uh, how's the wife? She's very well, thank you, Yayan. So are both of the children. Well, uh, thank you again, Mrs. Griffith Williams. Not at all. You'll be more than helpful. By the way, you must come to one of my literary parties one of these days. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Griffith Williams. Okay. You know who she is, don't you, John? Mrs. Griffith Williams? You're kidding. Oh, her husband's on the council. Married her in the wartime, he did. Mm. She came over with the free Norwegians. Really? Oh, very, very powerful man, Mr. Griffith Williams. He's one of those, is he? Oh, he's chairman of the library committee. Mm. Oh, extra special nice hours, I can tell you. You didn't creep, did you? Look, I wonder if she meant it, you know, about inviting us, I mean. Well, anything's possible, isn't it? In the mid-60s, Kenneth received an invitation that would change his life. 
He was asked to appear on the BBC's Tonight programme to discuss a subject of his own choosing. He chose the Anglo-Boer War. The programme was seen by two of the most important figures in broadcasting, BBC controllers Hugh Weldon and David Attenborough. They were impressed by what they saw. They asked Kenneth to make a documentary for them on the subject. He resisted. Until they made him an offer he couldn't refuse. They said, look, we'll pay you to try. Think about that. You can go anywhere you want to in the world, do what you like. We won't interfere. You can do what you like. I thought, they're mad. In Liverpool football ground, there is a large grandstand which supporters call the cop. Some of them call it Spion Cop. That grandstand in Liverpool is named after this mountain that I've just climbed and I'm sitting on in the middle of the old British colony of Natal in South Africa. Why was a grandstand in Liverpool football ground named after a mountain in Africa? Thereby hangs a fascinating and dreadful tale. At 8.30 in the evening, on the 23rd of January, 1900, 1,700 Lancashire soldiers climbed this mountain with some others, got to the top, and a large proportion of them were promptly executed. The day after the programme had gone out, Kenneth sat down on a park bench with a copy of the morning newspaper, almost too scared to read it. But when he did, he found himself praised for bringing a dimension of art to the documentary. He realized he was at a crossroads. It became clear, he said, that I was on the edge of terminating my life as an actor and moving into the biggest pulpit ever devised, television. From the 1960s onwards, Kenneth wrote and presented a series of groundbreaking TV documentaries. Drawing on his passionate interest in history, they were personal, idiosyncratic and highly subjective. I wrote to Hugh, would you please make it public within the BBC that I hope that I will never ever stoop so low in my life as to be objective about anything. If you were to ask me to make a film on the life of Pastor Niemöller, the brave Protestant who stood up to Adolf Hitler, and I wrote in parentheses, incidentally, a jolly good idea, if at the end of it you expect me to say, on the other hand, Himmler had his point of view, and he did, it's not on. You must ask a good Nazi to do that. He's very worried about this whole business of civilization. He, uh, he's not quite sure if it's, if it's working. Therefore, he, he's taken upon himself this role of looking for what is noble, what is fine, what is heroic, what is splendid, and contrasting it against what is petty, what is evil, what is uh, minuscule, what is unnecessary. Um, he's, he's, he, he's determined to castigate and to praise. Kenneth had started his documentary career with films about Britain's imperial exploits in Africa. Now he was to turn his gaze closer to home. Since childhood, Kenneth had been fascinated by Ireland. It was there that he found the subject of his next film, the life and death of IRA leader Michael Collins. He had no idea what kind of trouble he was about to stir up. I thought that the British viewer, if they were to hear and observe as far as was possible what Michael Collins observed and heard, they would then say at the end of the program or the following day, is this true? If this is true, then the sooner we apologize, because I have faith basically in the British people, in my people, that if this is true, then we ought to apologize to the Irish Irish and remove ourselves. During his own father's lifetime, well over one million Irish people died of starvation under English patronage. And he could see for himself what was happening during his old childhood. 
the greedy continuing exploitation of the land by most of the English landlords. And he could see that the options open to many of his native Irish people were still to go to hell or to go to the rocks of Connaught. Or to the United States of America. Oh yes, he was a very angry Irish lad. With the troubles in Northern Ireland then at their height, the film made uncomfortable viewing for the British establishment. It had been commissioned by Lou Grade, head of ATV, but when he and the committee of the Independent Broadcasting Authority saw it, they refused to show it on television. It was the start of a long struggle between Kenneth and the powers that be. I had to go to Downing Street. Wilson was Prime Minister. I had to see two Northern Ireland secretaries, that's Lord Deeds and Merlin Rees. And all of them, it was said, no, there is not one word in it that is inaccurate. But under no circumstances must it be shown to the British people. And of course, this is the only thing that ever gets censored or suppressed, is the truth. When the establishment is opposed to that truth. It would be 20 years before the British public got a chance to see Hang Up Your Brightest Colours. But that didn't stop Kenneth. He continued to make documentaries on subjects ranging from the infamous Hanging Judge Jeffries to the American War of Independence. Even when he made a rare appearance as a straight actor, his old enthusiasm shone through. In 1976, Kenneth appeared in the BBC Wales film Bus to Bosworth as a headmaster with a passion for history in charge of a school field trip. It gave Kenneth the chance to return to his roots and show his mettle as a Shakespearean actor. And Owen Glendore came and he inspired us all right. We sent the English packing. What were the words that Owen Glendore uh, said in uh, Shakespeare's Henry IV? Three times hath Henry Bolingbroke, who became Henry IV, three times hath Henry Bolingbroke made head against my power. Thrice from the banks of the Wye and Sandy Bottom Severn have I sent him bootless home. Oh, bootless home. Kenneth found a home for himself at BBC Wales during the late 1970s. He made a series of documentaries there. The first of these marked the centenary of the Battle of Sandalwana, near Rock's Drift. The Zulus began to shout, you may shoot us down, but we will trample you to death. Ammunition in that British firing line was running low. In many cases, there was nothing left except the bayonet. Back in the camp, uh, Lieutenant Smith Dorian began to smash ammunition boxes open and was promptly accosted by Quartermaster Bloomfield, who barked, for heaven's sake, don't take that man, for it belongs to our battalion. Smith Dorian pointed to the waves of charging Zulus and said, hang it all, Quartermaster, you don't want a requisition order now, do you? A few minutes later, Quartermaster Bloomfield was shot dead while handing out ammunition, uh, presumably to soldiers of his 2nd Battalion of the 24th Regiment. Kenneth's personal life was as explosive as his professional career. By the end of the 1970s, he'd been married and divorced three times. Time after time after time, I would say, he would come to me and say, um, oh, two. No. Um, I'd say, it's a woman, isn't it? He'd say, oh, yes, yes, yes. But she got this purity of spirit and, oh, God. Off we go again, and there he'd be at it. Um, no, no, no. He, 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 he put women on an altar mm. originally, and now he's spending great, having great fun knocking them off. <laughs> I've been absolutely ruthless, and I've caused deep and terrible distress. I live with it, not only to ex-wives in varying degrees three ex-wives, but also to my children, which is even more terrible. My father's always been a ladies' man, <laughs> and uh, I think this was painful, and also, um, having said he's a ladies' man, I believe 
he stated it publicly, he's self-confessed misogynist. And um, so I, this contradiction between a man who loves women and one that doesn't get on with them so well. Kenneth's attitude to women was rooted in his childhood. Because my mother walked out on me, I don't want to put it all on her poor shoulders, because she was a remarkable woman, and a lot of me came from her. Um, I never entered a relationship with a woman without having my bags packed to leave on the day I came in. That is, you, you don't trust women? No, I've never trusted women. One occasion where I lived with a woman who was apparently perfect for me, Maggie Kapala. She was intelligent, she was well ordered, she put my life into good order. For the first time, you see, I dropped my guard. I'd always kept my guard, I dropped it, and she went wham. And it was my comeuppance. No one, she, then I knew what I'd done to other people, because she went back to America, and I was wiped out. Kenneth eventually recovered from that blow. During his later years, he continued to produce creative and challenging work. I want to make it perfectly clear to you all that I am a Welshman. I am not an Englishman. He also received some long overdue recognition. In 1993, Hang Up Your Brightest Colors was finally shown on television. The following year, Kenneth was awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award by BAFTA Cymru. And even at the age of 82, he could still turn in a strong performance. X-ray is not too good, eh? No. Uh, I never did take a good photograph. Well, just as long as they don't look too closely at your papers, uh -huh. it would appear that you're an illegal immigrant, Mr. Peter. Will they send me back? You could apply for an extension or asylum. I came back here to the old country to see out my final days with as much dignity as I could manage. I didn't come back here to beg. I admire your courage, but sometimes you can't take on the system. Sometimes you just have to accept it. <laughs> Looking at you, of all people, I don't think you actually believe that. You must have fought very hard to get where you are. Sadly, this was to be Kenneth's last performance on screen. The final years of his life became a struggle against dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Kenneth Griffith died at the age of 84 in 2006. Kenneth lies buried here in Penelli Churchyard, next to his grandparents, Emily and Ernest. Like his grandfather, Kenneth Griffith lives on in what he left behind. The longer my grandfather has been in his grave, the the clearer his image appears to me, and the greater is his influence on me. Surely this is a sort of immortality. We hand on whatever we are, for better or for worse. We all have a say in the battle between good and evil. Indeed, we are the battle. 